Perfecto, ya estamos enlazados, bienvenidos. Okay, so thanks everybody for being here with us today. This is the, the first seminar of the Lairi EFD seminar series. We are very happy that, that you are here with us today. Uh, so just briefly talk about the, the, this effort. So I'm, I'm uh, Alejandro Lopez Feldman. I'm the president of the Latin American Association of Environmental and Resource Economists. I'm president for this year and next year. And uh, today is also here Jorge Maldonado, who is going to be the, who is the president elect and will be president starting in 2023. So this, this seminar is uh, a joint effort between LAIRI and EFD. For those of you that do not know, uh, EFD is the Environment for Development Initiative. And uh, EFD has uh, three centers in Latin America, uh, one in Central America, which is in, based in Costa Rica, one in Chile, and one in Colombia. So again, this, this is a, a joint effort between those three centers uh, of uh, EFD and LAIRI. What we are going to do is uh, we, we are aiming to have uh, one seminar every month, the, the first Wednesday of the month, actually. So the next one is going to be on April 7th. It's going to be by Anna Norden. Uh, we will give you more details on, on you know, later on, I mean, in, in, on the email, if you are part of LAIRI. And if not, uh, if you want to know more about the series and which are the seminars that are coming, you can check out uh, the different uh, social media that we have. So you can check it on Twitter, on Facebook, on the webpage. And again, if you are a member of LAIRI already, you, you are receiving these, these emails. So the... And if you are not a member of LAIRI, you should uh, take advantage of uh, the, the membership for 2021, which is still free. So you can go to the website and find the, the link for the membership. The seminar is part of the things that we are going to be doing. We are also uh, uh, joining efforts with different associations. We are having uh, some uh, sessions in an upcoming seminar that you are also know about because you are receiving the information in the, in the email from the Society of Cost Benefit Analysis. So that's coming at the middle of the month. Uh, we still have some opportunities for uh, graduate students to have uh, to apply for a scholarship for that uh, uh, conference. So if if you are interested in attending the social the the, 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 so, the so, uh, social cost benefit analysis conference at, at the uh, at mid-March, you can send us an email to Lairi and apply for, for the grant. So let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, Francisco, but before uh, reading no, explicitly from, from his bio, let me just say that uh, it's really a great pleasure for all, us, uh, for all of us at Lairi and EFD to have Francisco as the first speaker of the series. This was not a coincidence, this was planned because uh, uh, Francisco has been uh, during the last at least 15 years, he has been actively, uh, and, and one might even say, or it would seem like tirelessly, work on increasing the visibility of environmental economics research in Latin America, as well as in improving the capacity of those in the region that are doing research. But not only that, Francisco has also played a crucial role in the creation of regional institutions like LAIRI, EFD, and, and, and many others. So he's really a, a, a key player in all these things. And that's why we are very, very excited to have him here today uh, to present his, his research. So uh, Francisco is, is professor and chair of the Environmental and Natural Resource Economics Group at Wageningen University and Research. Before that, he was director and senior research fellow at the Economics and Environment for Development Research Program at CATIA in Costa Rica. As I was mentioning, in 2005, he, he founded and directed the Latin American and Caribbean Environmental Economics Program, which many of you are familiar and many of you uh, benefited from the grants that they, that they had and from the capacity building that they provided. In 2007, he contributed to the creation of the Environment for Development Initiative and was EFD Center Director for Central America. His work appears in a number of journals, including Nature Sustainability, Nature Climate Change, Journal of Public Economics, Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, Environmental and Resource Economics, Ecological Economics, and World Development. Francisco is currently Associate Editor of Energy and Resource Economics and Review of Environmental Economics and Policy. He has served as a consultant and advisor to the Global Environmental Fund, Inter-American Development Bank, IUCN, Nature Conservancy, United Nations Development Program, World Bank, and WWF, among others. Francisco's work has explored incentive-based approaches to generate improved private and public management of natural resources with a particular focus on climate change, biodiversity, and developing countries. 
Francisco has done work on payments for ecosystem services, natural protected areas, and community water management. He has undertaken studies using behavioral, experimental, and non-market valuation methods. And uh, today he's going to present uh, this work on input efficiency, technology adoption, and disadoption to our cities on uh, water saving technologies. So uh, before giving the, the floor to, to Francisco, let me please ask you if you, if you have questions, you can uh, write them in the chat and, and Jorge uh, will be kind of uh, looking at the questions and at the end of the presentation, we will, we will have uh, uh, some time for, for Francisco to answer those questions. If, if you prefer to write the questions in Spanish, you can write them in Spanish and then uh, 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 Francisco will answer them in, in English. So, the floor is yours, Francisco. Thank you very much for, for being here with us. Thank you, uh, Alejandro. I feel um, very uh, um, honored to be uh, opening this seminar series and very touched by your words. You made me nervous and everything, and, and that doesn't happen very frequently. <laughs> now I'm scared of the uh, responsibility you're putting on my shoulders. So let me start by sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so as Alejandro was saying, um, I am going to talk about input efficiency, technology adoption and disadoption. Uh, ba basically, this is work that I've conducted in the last years, uh, several years, uh, with Maria Hernedo, Paul Ferraro and Ben Meiselman. Um, I'm going to, uh, my hope today is that I'll present two papers. Uh, one looking at whether this water conserving technologies make sense uh, for households using our own estimations, but also experimentally elicited uh, time preferences, risk and time preferences. And then uh, I'm going to introduce uh, what we call an exposure incentive and show the role that such an incentive can play in reducing these adoption rates. Um, I hope that I'm not overly ambitious today. So, so if you help me keep track of time, that would be great. So what, when we talk about um, water conserving technologies, I'm talking about uh, technologies that are not available in the region. Um, this has, of course, um, an advantage uh, from a, a purely research design perspective because our control group basically is completely unexposed to these technologies. So, so let's say the presence of these technologies in our, in our control group is zero. But what is interesting is that these resource, uh, resource conserving or water conserving technologies are in principle uh, important to increase the efficiency of uh, water household use. And uh, they are widely touted as, as uh, key parts of the strategy, adapting to climate change, for example, or to water scarcity more generally. So why is this important? As I said, the use of this resource conserving technologies has been highlighted in numerous government and multilateral plans as a key component of adaptation strategies. The goal is to, for example, use less water per unit of activity or less energy per unit of activity. Now, underlying that, that push are two key claims. The first one is that this adoption of resource conserving technologies is a good strategy to address negative externalities. And uh, secondly, that uh, what we could call an efficiency paradox whereby Non adopting or even for even more disadopting consumers are leaving large amounts of cash on the table. So, this in principle, and there is an internality problem there. Now, evidence for both uh, uh, claims is unclear. The theory is not well developed, and frequently behavioral aspects are being ignored. And there is very little on water, there's a lot of energy, uh, but water is key for climate change adaptation. Uh, particularly given that uh, water in general is uh, frequently uh, subjected to suboptimal pricing, uh, either because it's subsidized or, or, or because it's not uh, priced volumetrically. Um, a key feature of our experiments is that we do a cost-benefit analysis uh, 
but we use time and risk preferences of the target population uh, in order to explore whether this adoption is justified or not. Uh, also, when it comes to this uh, um, water conserving technologies or research conserving technologies, this adoption is frequently a serious concern. Now, this is important for Central America, and what you have there is uh, the result of uh, modeling done by Inba Gedal, uh, that shows uh, the probability in, in more solid colors uh, of water going down by 20% uh, in red or going up by 20% in blue. And as you can see, this map is uh, rather a sad picture of what is going to happen in Central America uh, under, under current uh, climate change uh, predictions. So we need to be much more efficient in the way we use water in the region. So the, I have basically three research questions. First, do these things, do these water conserving technologies work? Um, engineers claim they do. Um, um, the second uh, hypothesis is to study this product adoption or this adoption puzzle. Uh, we want to understand uh, better whether people are actually leaving cash on the table, whether they are failing to see that these water conserving technologies are good for them. Uh, and the third question is, well, if this adoption is a problem, can we incentivize exposure uh, in order to increase, uh, uh, sorry, in order to reduce these adoption rates? Now, most of this research um, is observational. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the research focuses on the rebound effect. And uh, there is almost nothing on water and very little from middle and low income countries and coming from experimental designs. There's some, uh, here I'm just listing a few of the papers that are important for our study. Maybe the, uh, the, the most important one in this particular case is uh, the Fauli et al paper and that looks at a, a weatherization assistance program. This paper will, uh, I'll get back to it because it, it uh, and also the Davis et al paper, because they uh, were key uh, sources of, they were key influences in our design. These two papers basically find that uh, very sort of low reduction in, in energy use in this particular case, but they, it's not due to a rebound effect. It's actually due to failure of the technology itself. So the experimental, the, the prediction from engineers fail to account for key features of the field in which this uh, program was implemented that, and as a result, uh, to start with uh, this, these two uh, programs of cash for coolers and uh, the weatherization assistance program were in a way doomed for failure. And we want to make sure that, that's, that we start from a credible uh, sort of engineering uh, prediction. So how is that engineering estimates typically produced? Uh, well, basically, the, if you look at the backside of, of these products, there is a label and that label, it basically says that uh, the product uh, uses, for example, 20% less water per minute. So if, if you think that a household uses 100 gallons in time period and 10% comes from shower use, if you install the shower, you will be saving uh, two, two gallons, basically. So that's the logic of the engineering estimate uh, that comes in a way raw from the, from the package itself. Now, there are many reasons why uh, there could be differences between the engineering estimate and what you actually see in the, in the field. And we call these violations of the engineer's assumption. The first one is differences in the performance in the lab versus the field of the technology itself, for example, due to differences in water pressure, there is also installation and adoption success. There's also disadoption. Uh, there is the conventional rebound effect. And as I said, there is a lot of focus on the rebound effect because you install, basically the idea is that because you installed a technology that is more effective, this, this in essence lower the effective price of, for example, taking a bath or washing and cleaning. And as a result, um, you do more of that. Uh, you, you spend more water. Uh, because in essence, or you, you spend more time bathing or washing, or you clean more often, or you water your plants more often, in essence, because there is a lower effective price of doing that. Uh, 
There could also be changes in attributes unrelated to efficiency. For example, when it could be that you just simply don't like the light bulb and then you, you, you disadopt, for example. There's also moral licensing effect because basically you are now doing something good, so you do more of it, or you, 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 uh, you save water in one device, but then use more water in another one. And uh, priming and saliency effect and sun cost and house money biases all go in favor of the technology. And this means that if you have this you know, um, water saving technologies in front of you every time you wash, you wash your hands, then you are more aware of the need to save water. And this sunk cost and house money biases basically go to refer to the fact that if you have um, spent a lot of money in fixing this, in putting these technologies in, the, in your house, then you, you have a big incentive to make it work. And, uh, and as a result, you save water just to make sure that you didn't waste it your money. Um, as I said, the Fowley et al. paper and the Davis et al. paper uh, influenced our experimental design, and this is how. We wanted to make sure that we move from the, the label that is in the packaging of the product to actual, uh, let's say, enhanced engineering estimates. And for that, we need to account for how much water was used in the different devices. So in a subset of households that will not be part of our, the experiment that I'm describing uh, in the future, we use, we put these meters to, to identify how much water was used in different uh, settings. And um, that allow us to go from 27.7%. Uh, 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 this is the estimated reduction in water using our own meters to capture how much is potentially consumed through each device. Um, so that's about 6.9 uh, cubic meters of water saved. This is this. Uh, this then goes down if we ask owners to open the water in, say, in a typical fashion. We don't typically open the taps fully. Uh, after accounting for actual installation success, this prediction goes down to 22.1%. And after accounting for uses that are not affected by the technology, the enhanced engineering estimate, EEE, is 4.9 cubic meters, so about 20%. So, what am I saying here? This is after all these corrections, we are still hoping to find a 20% effect in a reduction in water consumption in the households in which we install the technologies. The, the idea is that the technologies then will save 4.9 cubic meters of water per month to these households. This is our experimental design. I'm not going to go in, in detail uh, here. But um, let me see if I can. Okay, so so we started with uh, with about one thousand nine hundred households uh, that were approached by one of our four teams. So they had a list of nineteen hundred houses. Then uh, about thirteen hundred opened the door, and uh, about thirteen hundred uh, households agreed to have the technology installed if they were chosen. These uh, households were randomized into two treatments, a control and a treated group that was uh, that was then the, the, the control, uh, sorry, the treated group uh, was further divided in a second uh, randomized control trial into uh, a group that received a bonus if the tech was in place four months after installation and a group that had no bonus. So basically, and then, by the way, we did uh, audits at four and 16 months. So this is one of paper that I'm going to present first, and this would be the second paper that I'm going to present today too. Oops, how do I take this away? Give me just a second, lovely. So let's look at paper number one. The question here is very simple. Do they reduce water consumption and is this reduction profitable? This is the, the, the results. And in this first column, you have the pretreatment results of so the aspect that there is nothing there. This result uh, show the, the reduction in water uh, after 16, 16 months. Uh, so this is about 221 uh, cubic meters of water uh, 
were saved. And this, this is about 9% uh, reduction in water. Now, if you divide, because we are able to divide, we had a, a sort of a, a midline uh, and an endline survey that allows us to, to study early, middle, and late uh, the behavior at three stages in our, uh, in our uh, data collection process. So we are able to see that uh, the effect also changes over time. It goes down a little bit, starting with uh, uh, about 11% reduction in water as a result of having the technologies installed. And it goes down to about eight, uh, eight um, uh, cubic meters of water. Uh, sorry, 8%. Um, this, you can see this effect also here. This is water consumption in cubic meters. Uh, and the red line is the moment in which we deliver our treatment. So the, 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 as you can see in the, the zero line is here, the effects are significantly, there's a significant reduction in water consumption and, um, and that it, the effect wanes a little bit over time. Okay, so far, uh, I think I've, I've shown you, uh, I've shown you a, a standard RCT. So I think what is really interesting about this paper is that we're able to do this. So here's the uh, technology that has, uh, uh, zero effect. Can you see my pointer? You can, right? Alejandro, can you see my pointer? Yes, we can. Yes, yes, yes we can. Okay, good. So here's a technology that has zero effect. And as I told you, the if you look at the basic engineering estimate, that one that comes from a label, we were expecting a 27.7% reduction. We were able to uh, produce a much more accurate or enhanced engineering estimate of 20.5%. And what you see here is the 95% confidence interval of that result. And this is what we find. This is our ex uh, experimental estimate of 9.1% water reduction. And, and at the same time, you, you can see here the 95 confidence interval. So there is a big gap. And most of the paper then uh, goes to study why we observe that big gap. For example, we uh, did a careful analysis of this adoption, trying to see if this adoption is responsible for, for uh, the difference between the enhanced engineering estimate and the experimental estimate. And we are able to impute about 20% of that difference on these adopters, people who disadopted at different stages. But still, there is a very large gap between the, the experimental estimate and the enhanced engineering estimate. And that large gap, I think, uh, is related to attributes uh, of the technology that are not related to, to the price. So this is not a rebound effect. These are uh, related to characteristics of the technology itself. Now, armed with those results, we do the second thing that is very interesting, I think, from this paper we do a welfare analysis. And we explore the expected welfare change resulting from, uh, from this uh, analysis. And we start with the basic engineering estimate. So if you take the basic engineering estimate uh, and you assume the, the a lifespan of the technology that corresponds to the warranty, that is also in the label, you assume trouble-free installation, no uncertainty, and you use the standard discount rate that is used, for example, in McKinsey and typically this typical discount rates that are used in cost benefit analysis, you find that the installation of this technology will produce 200 and, uh, has a net present value of 220 US dollars. So, so this is a very profitable investment if you, if you believe this is the case. Now, when you look at the average treatment effect, so if you use our average treatment effect, the lifespan reported by households, field data, Still without uncertainty um, and using this, this discount rate, the, the net present value goes down to about five. So already there, five US dollars, already there you can see that the effect is not uh, as fantastic as was initially predicted. And what we do next is we look at uh, our, uh, so we introduce uncertainty, which allows us to use not only our own discount rate, which was estimated for that population and uh, risk aversion. Uh, and that already gives us negative net present value. Even if we look at the complier, complier average causal effects, so people who stick to the technology until the 16th month, 
we we have either very small positive or 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 even negative uh, net present values for that group. So um, by by way of quick con uh, conclusion of this, we can say well yes, uh, they work. These technologies work, but not as predicted. Not they are not as uh, uh, profitable uh, as predicted. And when we do this in, in welfare terms, we believe there is no cash left on the table. Now, uh, I'm going to go quickly to the second uh, paper. Um, in this paper, we look at exposure enhanced goods and technology disadoption. As I said here, the, 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 the key paper, key element of this paper is that we want to see if we can increase exposure and by doing that, whether that leads to uh, reduce this adoption. And remember that we, the treated group was divided into two, a group that received a bonus and the group that received no bonus. So we are going to use this randomization as a, a key to identify the effect of, of the of exposure on uh, the survival of the technology. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in the coming slides. Um, so the basic pre premise of this paper, of this paper, the second paper, is that people disadopt goods and practices with positive externalities. And here you have just four examples in terms of precision agriculture, cooks, improved cookstoves, uh, mosquito nets, light bulbs, and so on. There are many cases in which people disadopt things that we believe are good for society, but especially good for them. And, and this is something that we want to explore. Um, so in, there are basically three policy tools that are available to promote uptake and reduce this adoption. The first one that we, we read in the literature is a purchase subsidy, for example, giving the technology for free. An alternative will be to uh, give a use subsidy, which will be a permanent payment as long as you keep the technology. And in this paper, we explore a third one, which would be an exposure incentive. This is a subsidy that you pay for a few months but that has a limited span. So you, you, you stopped after a few periods. We then use a conceptual model to show that exposure incentives can actually outperform both purchase subsidies and use subsidies. And this happens in under two circumstances. First, when there is future, when, when there is present biases, administrative costs or liquidity constraints, all this uh, present bias means that, that people uh, care uh, have a big discount rate, uh, or when there is administrative costs in making payments that are permanent, like in the case of uh, uh, a permanent subsidy, or uh, and when there are liquidity constraints, when, when for example, a local government cannot commit to, to subsidizing a, a, a technology for many, many periods. And also, when using a good makes subsequent use, subsequent use much more likely, for example, when there is information, taste, or ability created through exposure. Now, um, these terms, information, taste, and ability, have different names in the, in, the, in the literature. I'm not going to go into this because I don't think I'll have the time. But um, you, you, you can see, for example, that taste is, is called habit formation in the literature, uh, or learning by doing. We use a mathematical model to, to build a little bit of uh, policy intuition. Here, uh, the use of the technology uh, is captured by R, whether you use it or not. And then there is a taste ability and information component, whether in which you acquire information from being exposed to the technology, you acquire information about how good the technology is for you. And then of course the subsidy. And as I said, when there is uh, no present, uh, uh, sorry, when there is present bias, but there is no information, then it's better to just give the technology for free, for example, according to this model. When there is no present bias, but there is information, taste, and ability that are built up, then it's better to use a subsidy uh, that is permanent. But when you have present bias, or administrative costs, as I said, or liquidity constraints by the local government. And when information, taste, and ability are obtained through being exposed to the technology, then our exposure incentive um, outperforms these other policy tools. This, there is a very simple intuition to this. 
let's say that using the technology gives you negative um, um, benefits in the first years and then positive. Why? Because there is taste, information, and ability from use. You acquire that, and therefore, after a while, you are happy with the, the technology itself. But if this, if your, if your let's say, um, annual or monthly uh, benefits look like this, then you will do uh, the net present value of these net benefits, and it's going to be negative. So you will uh, disadopt after the first period. If you give a purchase subsidy, uh, of course, then your benefits in that first period are going to be positive. You're going to be you're very happy about that. But then you will do the same analysis of net present value and this adopt in the second period. But if you give an exposure incentive for three periods in this particular case, in the next period, the net present value is positive and, this, and the, basically the technology will survive in your home. In order to explore this, uh, um, we, we do an RCT. Uh, we give a bonus to a, a group uh, that is randomly chosen and no bonus to another group. Then we do a, a, an audit four months afterwards. Uh, and in that audit, we already see that uh, there is a difference in adoption, uh, in this adoption, sorry, between the group that received the bonus, who disadopted, where we, where we see 8% disadoption, and the group uh, that received no bonus, in which we see 17% disadoption. Now, we then go uh, about a year after and conduct a second audit in which we recorded which, which of the technologies were still in place. And this audit, both the, the audit, the first and the second audits were uh, unexpected. So the, the, the households uh, did not know when we were coming. And we see there are a difference in, in this adoption rates uh, in both groups, as you can see here. So we're going to see this, we use this difference uh, to estimate the effect of exposure. What we're going to do is to estimate the prior average causal effect of using, using ca the cash bonus, which was randomly allocated as an instrument for exposure in a two-stage uh, uh, model, as you can see here. The first stage will be the effect of the, of the cash bonus, Z, on, on this adoption, and then we use predicted uh, uh, D uh, in the second stage. And uh, these are the results. You have here the first stage of the model. What you have here is the ITT um, uh, looking at 16 months of use. And these results, 0 0.868 is our main result here. This basically says that exposure increases use after 60 months by 87%. This is of course under the assumption that uh, missingness or, or, or attrition is random conditional on observable characteristics. And, and we provide tests of that in the paper. Um, the water bill, um, we have information on the water bills, of course, that's where we derive the information for, for this analysis. And as you can see, the, the the, the information mechanisms require, re, remember that there were three mechanisms, information, taste, and ability. And the information mechanism, I mean, certainly was in place. Uh, households actually received a lower, uh, in this part, uh, a lower uh, bell every month as a, result of, as a result of having the technology installed. We also see some evidence that uh, the taste mechanism was active. So we ask, uh, people if they had problems with the technology and those who received the bonus, those who were uh, um, you know, received this, this, the treatment were less likely, significantly so, uh, uh, they were less likely to complain about the technology not delivering uh, water. So apparently there is also some taste mechanism that is uh, promoted by, by being exposed to the technology. So uh, we conclude that uh, exposure incentives can have a long run impact on behavior, as we can see, 86% or 87%. They operate through information, ability, and taste mechanism. And they are, we believe, an alternative to purchase and use subsidies when taste plays a role and when there are liquidity constraints, so when governments cannot sustain a, a permanent subsidy. And that's it, I managed. Thank you.
Francisco, thank you so much for the presentation. Very interesting. And um, it's also um, quite interesting to see how you managed to put the two articles together. Um, so far we have uh, two questions from the audience. Um, one of them is from Irene. Uh, she was asking for the, um, for the first paper, how did you measure risk and time preferences? So um, this is actually a second, pa a separate paper in which we uh, use the Anderson methodology, uh, the Harrison methodology, sorry, to, to measure uh, time and risk preferences experimentally. So we run a, a, an, an experiment uh, that allows us to identify the discount rate and the risk preferences of uh, households in the same region, a different set of households in the same region. So this is, these are experimentally elicited uh, time and, and risk preferences. So financial based multiple price lists. Exactly, yes. Okay. But what we, we are able to, to, that's a part of the, of, of the risk and time preference that I didn't show, but we use the curvature of the utility function to estimate time and risk preference jointly. So I think that's an interesting uh, paper, but I clearly didn't have the time to, to present it here. It makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Nice to hear you. OK, and I have another question and comment from Carlos Munoz. Um, given that we have time and we are quite a manageable group, Carlos, are you interested in doing the question by yourself? Put down your mic. Okay, now now it's working. Uh, yeah, thank you for organizing the the events um, to the organization and the and the organizers and Francisco. Thank you for for this wonderful presentation. Uh, very interesting findings. Very powerful stuff. Um, and hello, uh, you know, uh, it's really nice Hola, to Carlos. <laughs> exactamente, igualmente, Francisco. Thanks. Um, so I, I was asking just, you know, you, you frame your presentation in the context of how water is important for, for climate change issues and, and how behavioral aspects associated to these findings are often neglected. And um, I'm just very curious to hear from you, what's next? What's the next step? What would it take for uh, these kinds of technologies to be adopted adopted a lot. You also mentioned the issue on, you know, on non-adoption and, and what would it take to, to frame these findings into policy so that we can actually see more of these being implemented all over the place, everywhere in every country. You highlighted a little bit at the, on the end of your presentation before I asked the question. So part of it is already answered, but I'm, I'm very curious to hear more and more for you. How do we put this into policy for scaling? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlos, and, and really a pleasure to see you. Um, I, I think uh, the, these two papers have different policy relevant conclusions. The first paper is just a cautionary tale, uh, in a way, of, of the dangers of uh, just taking uh, information for granted and then develop a big program and then uh, at the end have economists come to you and say, oh, you know, there was no impact. Uh, and the reason there is no impact is not because there is, because uh, let me just take one step back. When, when you are, when you, when you read uh, engineering reports on why a program fails or not, and when you even, for example, read the responses to the Fowley et al. paper or the Davis et al. paper uh, that I saw Adam mention uh, also, and what you see is that they always blame me on something. It's like, oh no, people disadopted for some bad reason because they were either fools or because um, there was a problem in, the, in, the, in which the devices were installed or people just failed to see there is a, you know, it's a problem of, of, the, of the others. And what we show here is that it's not. Um, I mean, these technologies are not necessarily 
uh, delivering what they promise once you adjust them to the reality of the field. So if you're going, as a government, if you're going to invest a lot of money into this, make sure that you, your predictions are adjusted to the reality of the field to start with. I'm talking about the enhanced engineering. But then there is a value in doing small pilots, pilot uh, studies looking at uh, the actual effect that you can predict and then check whether that effect balances well with the cost of the project itself, something that is very seldom done. So that's the lesson from the first paper. And from the second paper, I think the main lesson there is that if you want to push for a technology, uh, typically people think, okay, give it for free, which is the purchase subsidy, or um, subsidize it permanently. Uh, you and I have worked on payment for ecosystem services, for example. So the, the, there is a comparison there. Either you pay for ecosystem services forever, or you subsidize a plantation, for example. It's the same logic there. But it, it might happen that by just providing a short-term exposure incentive, uh, you can actually get the, the change in behavior at a much cheaper price, particularly if you're cash constrained, constrained or there, there's a present bias in your political analysis. And I think that's a powerful conclusion from the other side. Carlos. Thank you, Francisco. <clears throat> um, Laura, uh, please go ahead. Please, Laura, activate your mic. Hello. Hello, Laura. Hi, hi, Francisco and friends. Uh, hi, colleagues, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you, Francisco, for a great presentation. This is a very interesting piece of work and I look forward to seeing uh, well published. I wanted to ask about the external validity, especially I'm thinking about the first paper. Is there anything that is particular of these households that you can think of? Let's say if, if you were to replicate this paper somewhere else, would you find the same results? Or is there anything that is specific to this context that uh, you should, um, maybe modify or qualify your cautionary tale by saying um, this context matters because something else. And uh, I'm thinking also about uh, Lucas Davis' work also on energy. And I see that there's um, some literature building up around the fact of um, engineering solutions not, um, not being uh, completely to the standard, not delivering completely the standard. So I see that there, this is a very nice contribution coming from a different field, uh, which is water management that complements very well that literature on energy. So just to mention that, thank you. Thank you, Laura. So, so I think when it comes to external validity, um, so this is an, a, a, a rural population in Costa Rica. Uh, households are, are low, low income households. And uh, there are particular features of, of the, of the of that reality that of course limit uh, the transfer of our results into into other settings i think our results will transfer nicely into other areas of the rural world or the developing world but of course if you have let me give you an example of where our results will change if you have a lot of water let's say then the technologies work better, right? Because then the pressure of the water is, is much higher and the technologies are then more effective in keeping it at bay in a way, keep it under control if you want. In that sense, I believe the difference between the, the, the basic engineering estimate and the enhanced engineering estimate will be smaller. At this moment, we are assigning about 8% touch points uh, to that difference, but that's because pre pressure uh, in the lab is different from pressure in the field in, in Costa Rica, it's much lower in the field. But if the pressure in the field is much higher, then, uh, then there is hope, hope, I mean, there is going to be a smaller difference between the basic engineering estimate and the enhanced engineering estimates. And what we do in the paper actually is go step by step through all the, uh, to, step by step to describe all the reasoning and how we actually check all these steps to to correct for the, the engineering estimate and then to 
deliver our own uh, average experimental estimate. And um, so I think uh, in that way, hopefully, somebody interested in the external validity of the study will say, well, this study applies in this, this, and this element, but not on these others. But, but I think that's, uh, in general, um, we are very transparent in, in the way we, we get to these different estimates, and that will allow uh, an easy transfer of benefits, if you want, uh, transfer of results into other settings. And, and regarding your second comment, I fully agree. That's, that's I think, the point. Uh, so much money goes into these uh, projects that we need to be extraordinarily responsible in choosing the right uh, strategies and the right technologies. Great. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, David, if you want to activate. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Francisco. Um, I, I guess I have two questions. Well, in, in your model, you presented that you have taste, ability, and experience. And in, in your setting, what, what matters more um, for people to, in the behavior, for the behavioral change in the end? And um, the other one is that does prior belief <laughs> uh, matter in this setting? Like, if people thought or didn't believe the engineers in the first place, uh, did they affect the this adoption in the end? It's like, oh, I know that these advi uh, like um, propagandas are not true like, at all. Something. Yes. Like you know. So, uh, regarding your first question, I don't know. I, I we didn't. Uh, we are not able to 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 explore which of the mechanisms, taste, ability, and information is the most important one in our particular case. Uh, I think information and taste do play a role. As with all these technologies, there's something, something's changed, right? And, and uh, um, it's like, you know, in a way, uh, learning to do something new. At the beginning, it's hard, but then you get used to it. Uh, you realize that you're saving money, which is the information uh, element there. And uh, after a while, you get used to the way that water flows through the technology, which is quite different, actually. I mean, for all, for all of you who are living in a sort of urban context or a more or less newer house, you will have these technologies already installed and you're used to this. Um, but um, I think those two for me uh, are what, what I think is more important. When it comes to the second question, that's what we call uncertainty in the in the welfare analysis. Remember that there was a column that, where it says with or without uncertainty. And I, I, I think I forgot to say that when it comes to uncertainty, we allow for, for, for example, differences in price because the higher the, ex, the expected price in the future, so if the price is going to be very high, then the, the monetary value of saving water is much bigger. Uh, but it could also be that People have different beliefs in, in the quality of the product. So they think, no, this is going to break down at two, five, 10 years. And then we account for that uncertainty. Uh, and at the same time, there could be some distrust in the technology or in engineers or the government. And, uh, and so that people think, yeah, but this, this is working now, but, but uh, I don't believe it really worked like that. So we account for that uncertainty. Once you introduce this uncertainty, um, and risk aversion, the technology goes down dramatically in terms of welfare uh, impact. Thank you, Francisco, and thanks, David, for the for the questions. Um, Irene, have you raised your hand? Uh, please go ahead. Muted. There we go, thanks. Um, I have a question regarding the rebound effect. Is there any way you can proxy a change in water usage from your surveys? I mean, you might not be able to calculate it and get a value unless you have water meters or something on the sort of the sorts, but do you have anything in your survey that might allow you to do that? A change in activities, changing? So we... <sighs> I mean, when it comes to the conventional rebound effect, this would be uh, because there is a, a, a lower effective price of baiting, you bait for longer. Uh, 
we we do not have any evidence uh, we collect evidence on behavioral changes of that sort and none of it points to a behavioral change i think these technologies they they do not necessarily drive to such a dramatic reduction in 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 so the price effect is not that big it is uh, significant but it's not something that it's, it's not like buying a, an electric car compared to a, a fossil fuel based car uh, so uh, we believe that there is no conventional rebound effect in our data. Um, most of what we think is that uh, the, the difference between the enhanced engineering estimate and the, the experimental estimate has to do with uh, a bit with this adoption, about 20%, uh, and then uh, uses that, of, that are unrelated to, to the technology. For example, if you're just making a soup and you need a little water, it doesn't matter if that liter of water comes in a few seconds or in 10 seconds, you still need a liter of water. So there, in those cases, um, and we, we seen that the, the potential of the technology to impact behavior is limited. But yeah, there is no, we, we do have uh, uh, our, our main dependent variable is water consumption, which is meter in this case. And there is no obvious rebound effect uh, in the data. Can I ask another question? If there's really. nobody after me. Yes, please go ahead. Um, from the people that were intervened, that were given the new faucets, um, did you see any peer effects or neighbor effects from neighbors or family members wanting to get that as well? So we, 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 there is, there, there are several things to this. So when, when we installed the new technology, we took the old one with us. So that's that's one. Uh, but still, people could, could just, you know, take the technology uh, out and then install it on the neighbor's house or even sell it to the neighbors. As I said, the technology was not available. Um, we we ask reasons for this adoption and so on, and, and we don't see this uh, happening. So there is very little peer effects. This is not something that is... Uh, that really shows it's something that happens really within the house and we don't see uh, the experiment was uh, it, it had a very little density in terms of uh, of uh, in a given house, sorry, in, a, in a given community the density by which we pick up households was low in that sense precisely to avoid having I don't know big groups of people with the technology showing off about it or talking about it in, 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 with neighbors. Um, so I don't think there is a, a peer effect on the others. It, it will be interesting to, to explore that. Definitely. Thanks. Thank you, Irene. Uh, is there any other questions? We have like a four minutes left for questions or comments. So um, uh, while people think they have another question, let me just say something about La Lairi, uh, Jorge, if I may. Sure, go ahead. So for, for many years, uh, a group of us, of Latin Americans have been trying to organize around uh, Latin American Association of Environmental and Resource Economists. And in the recent years, Alejandro, Jorge, Rodrigo Arraga, Felipe Vasquez, and others, uh, Claudia Aravena, uh, have made a, a huge effort at setting up and launching um, um, this association. And it's, it's highly, uh, you know, when it comes to the EAIRI Association, the European Association, and when it comes to the American Association, they are very excited uh, of having uh, sort of a, a, a new sister organization. Um, uh, they are looking forward to having a, a strong presence of Latin Americans in the, in the board, for example, of the World Congress. There is an enormous demand for what we're trying to set up here, but it will only survive if we join in, in big groups and, and join the association, I, I, I think, and also eventually, uh, you know, take over the association from Alejandro and, and Jorge and, and so on and so forth. Um, we need active people in order to make sure that there is more exchange of, uh, 
of uh, research and environmental economics thinking uh, in Latin America. Uh, I mean, really, uh, when we started 20 years ago, there was nothing, no exchange between countries. There were good people in the countries, but there, were no, there was no interaction. And uh, we've managed to do that now. And uh, I think this is probably the best shot we have at, at launching a professional association. So please join in mass. Uh, this is a great thing. Uh, and I'm very happy to see uh, this important project in the hands of Alejandro and Jorge. It's, it's, uh, it's a very safe uh, nest, the, the project has found. Thank you, Francisco, and you are right. We are very excited of uh, uh, making strong this, um, this association. Um, I have um, post the link to the membership of the association, which is uh, free for this year. So uh, I invite all of you to take advantage of this and uh, let your friends and colleagues know about this. Um, okay, I think just um, we are on time. So I will let uh, Alejandro to close our first successful session of uh, the LAERE EFD um, join group in environmental economics. Thank you, thank you, Jorge, and of course, uh, thanks, Francisco, for the wonderful presentation. And, and as, as Francisco and Jorge were saying, I mean, this is uh, you know, this this effort that in the only way it's going to be successful is if we have the participation of the of the members, and if we have uh, more and more more members, so we can show. Uh, strength in numbers to, to the European and American associations and they can see that this is really something that's going to happen and the association is something that's really going to uh, uh, be uh, a long-term institution. So uh, I, I'm not, I don't have any, anything else to say except that as I said at the beginning, this, these seminars are going to happen every, every month on, on Wednesdays. So please uh, be we keep an eye open on the next uh, seminars and we will try to have the schedule ready for at least uh, the, the next uh, five or six seminars and we will post it on, on our social media as well as on the web so that you can have an idea of what's coming in, in the future. And as uh, of course, in addition to EFD centers, we have to thank uh, Uniandes, which is helping us to, to with the logistics of all this stuff. And that's very important that we have a strong support of, of uh, an institution as, as Uniandes to make this happen. So thanks, thanks everybody. And, and hope uh, we will see you next month and, and invite us, or I said, your friends, colleagues to join the association and to come to these uh, seminars. Thanks everybody. Have a good thank day. You. Afternoon. Thanks everyone. See you all. Bye. Have a good day. Alejandro, nos quedamos un ratito. Y si quedamos un momentito. David, muchísimas gracias. Mucho gusto.